Hello. Hello. Ah, uh, can you hear me? Hello, Ali. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, it sounds okay. Should I uh, also have earphones? You don't have any echo. Everything's good. Yeah, yeah. No echo. Your okay. mic is fine, loud and clear. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just gonna. If you just give me a second, I'm just gonna tweet this as well. Is that into tweet it? Yeah, sure, sure. Please. Live now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure, please. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, you Thanks. can. Yeah. It, I'll it, just do an introduction. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can hear you. Are you? Uh, is it just you or? Uh, uh, no, it... today I'll be taking your interview. Yeah. So okay. Okay. Saurashtra is a little busy. Yeah. He's there on backstage. Mm -hmm. He'll be conducting okay. the other thing. Okay. That sounds good. Just give me yeah. one second once I tweet it so that people can join yes. from my Twitter. Yeah. Because uh, I want. Yeah. Sure, I sure. want to make sure you get a bit of an audience here. Yeah, yeah, that will be good. Uh, there you go. So, yeah. So, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our stream. Yeah. Welcome to Rational Thinkers. And today we will yeah. be having a very prominent ex-Muslim atheist, uh, Ali Rizvi, who is well known for his YouTube channel, from his YouTube channel, Secular Jihadist quite an interesting name itself and then he has also authored few books a book uh, to be precise and today we will be listening from him his life journey and how he uh, what were the circumstances under which he convert he left islam or what was his what we uh, upbringing like where was he born and all other stuff so yeah hello rizvi welcome to the show Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Happy Halloween. That's my favorite yeah, religious Halloween. holiday. Yeah, it is a religious oh, holiday. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. So this week in India, we will be having uh, what is said to be uh, a favorite uh, festival for all, most of the Indians. Uh, probably the second favorite. Maybe the Holi mm -hmm. is the most favorite. So this yeah, Diwali. And this week we will be having Diwali. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Holi and Diwali are uh, somewhat, you can say, a secular festival. Like, they are not secular indeed, but yeah, everybody can celebrate and it's just fun. Uh, so, so it's like Halloween yeah. itself. Yeah, but in different ways. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, that's wonderful. Happy yeah. Diwali, everybody. We do it too. Happy Diwali yeah. to yeah. the audience, whoever is celebrating it as <laughs> an occasion of victory of uh, good over evil which Ram and Krishna are said to have uh, defeated their respective counterpart on, counterparts on this day. Mm -hmm. So, Rizvi, yeah. Uh, so, uh, should I call you Ali or Rizvi? Probably Ali will be better. Right? Ali is good. Ali is good, yeah. Ali, Ali, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, later on I will ask how that Rizvi also, Rizvi surname, got yeah. attached to so many Rizvis that we have. Uh, <laughs> Throughout the subcontinent as well as probably in Persia as well. 
So yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, so the mic is yours. Uh, you can start with a little brief introduction of yourself, like from of your childhood, especially where you were born, where you were born, and how was your childhood like? Uh, how were your parents like? Vis a vis mm-hmm. your uh, liberties and religion, and uh, how was the society like where you where you grew up? So uh, if you can little bit briefly explain us oh. that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's how we I'll start. try to make it. Yeah, I'll try to make it as brief as possible. So my, uh, no, I, you can uh, I, you can be a little detailed as well. I'm sorry, but you can I, 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 sorry a bit. You can be yeah. a little detailed as well, so we can understand the society in which you grew and all those things. Sure thing. Yeah, I. Uh, so my my parents are actually from India. Uh, my uh, mother's family is from Delhi. My mother was born in Mathura. You know, you know that has a lot of religious uh, Hindu significance. Uh, my father was born in Allahabad, and. So he's from UP, <clears throat> and both of their families uh, migrated to Pakistan. I think my mom's family migrated about three years after partition. Uh, I was born in Lahore, um, and I think when I was about six months old, we moved to Tripoli, Libya. Uh, so I lived in Libya uh, for quite a while, and then after that, we moved to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. We lived in Saudi Arabia for you know a little over a decade. Went to school there, um, and then. After that, I I went to Pakistan. Pakistan is like I went to medical school in in Pakistan, and then uh, after that, my family moved to Canada. So we came to Canada. I went to grad school in Canada, then went back and went to the U.S. to do my residency and fellowship, and then uh, came back to Canada. I've been living here uh, ever since. Now, so that was my just the geographical journey. So, and one of the, one of the things that happens when you live in many different parts of the world. Um, is in, and especially I lived in uh, three different Muslim majority countries uh, until the age of 24. 24 is the age when I first came to North America and moved here. So there, there are three, you know, Libya, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, all three of them are Muslim majority countries, but they're very different culturally. So you see a lot of that interplay between culture and religion and how that plays out. And it's a really interesting dynamic. And, um, you know, you, you, and when you're being raised religiously, uh, it kind of uh, like for me from very early age, I, I just saw the that a lot of the religion in a local area was really influenced by the culture. For example, you know, Muslims in Pakistan probably have more in common with Hindus in India than they do with Muslims in Turkey or Muslims in Egypt, right? And then um, you know, Muslims in in Libya probably have more in common with, you know, the, the Muslims in, in their neighboring regions, uh, the, the, sorry, the people from other religions in their neighboring regions than they do with the Muslims in Saudi Arabia. So so that was a really interesting interplay. And I, I became a skeptic at a at a very early age, a religious skeptic. I, you know, I, I'm in the sciences. I'm a physician. I've, um, I, my graduate degree was in biochemistry. So I studied the hard sciences for most of my life. And I've always looked for evidence for claims. And, um, you know, people used to tell me that, you know, we've got religion and then you have science and those are two separate, uh, you know, the the Stephen Jay Gold, I think it was Stephen Jay Gold's uh, concept of the non-overlapping magisteria, the science and religion, uh, they occupy different compartments and you can compartmentalize them. And and I, I just never agreed with that because to me, when you say the the prophet split the moon in two, you know that's that's not a religious claim. That's a scientific claim. Or you know, if you say that there were Adam and Eve and Eve, ate, or, or there was a virgin birth, uh, or even some of the, some of the myths in Hinduism, all of these things, like there are there are scientific claims about the natural world uh, that don't have any evidence for them. So uh, that's I, I I tended to move away from that and move more into the. Uh, you know, it's the realm of the unknown. I got very comfortable with not knowing the answers. And I think that's that's a really important thing to have, have a trusting, a confident, trusting relationship with uncertainty and uh, the unknowable. And uh, once you get comfortable in that relationship with the unknown, um, you really start opening up your mind. You start opening yourself up to all kinds of great questions about the universe and life and everything else. Wonderful. Uh, that's quite a fascinating journey, I must mm-hmm. say. And should I say you have been you have been lucky to witness the good and bad of both the world, of the Orthodox societies as well as the free society that you are presently staying. And 
so you said like you were skeptic at a very early age mm-hmm. so like what like when you joined your medical by the time were you skeptic or prior to oh. that you can say like no this is actually a, this is an interesting story i i wrote about it in my book in lotel but um it was my first exposure to death is when i was 5 years old um and I, i had a cousin my first cousin my mother's sister was 3 and she was in uh, she had childhood leukemia right uh, acute lymphocytic uh, lymphoblastic leukemia which is a disease now is curable when you know kids can be from it but at that time right late 70s early 80s there was no cure for it so uh it was a terminal disease and she was 3 and you know she was I was, I was 5 she was 3 you know we used to play together as kids you know so we were in the UK when during her last moments and when she was uh dying uh, we my you know how they do in our culture and you know, they brought everybody in the room uh and I saw this this child just sort of you know if you've seen cancer deaths they're horrendous as it is in a 3 year old child they're even even more horrendous uh, so i'm i'm seeing this at age 5 my father was standing next to me so i asked him i said you know what's happening uh, to to my cousin and he said well allah is taking her back he's she's going back to allah he's taking her away he wanted to put like a positive spin on it so then i uh, <clears throat> i asked that so i asked him i said well you know my mother and my aunt you know they're standing on her by her bedside and they're reading from the Quran they're praying they're crying uh so the why are they doing that and he said it's because they're they're asking Allah not to take her away they're they're begging Allah don't please don't take her away so immediately to my 5 year old mind i was immediate i immediately thought thought of this was a game of tug of war you know where Allah's on one side you know putting this girl through tremendous agony taking her away her mother and and is trying to pull her back and you know obviously there's this is not there's a power imbalance here you know allah is obviously powerful he doesn't have to extend the process but he's doing it so my first introduction immediately then as a 5 year old kid is this, this guy this uh, this is a say this is absolute sadism whoever is doing this so uh, it seemed like it was the villain you know how they to kids you know go to sleep at night or the boogeyman will come so i thought that allah was like the but much prize over the next couple of days when we had the funeral you know the janaza and all that um uh, everybody was praying to god and you know praising god and this was very confusing to me and as older you know i did become religious my parents were religious they raised me in that way but i always had a sort of uh, I, i was always a little uncomfortable with it you know i'd see for example on uh, when there was a plane crash uh and there were two or three survivors and they'd come up they say it's a miracle you know god saved us and we're so grateful to the lord for sparing our lives and i'd always think what about the other 200 people on the plane you know what did they do wrong that god didn't spare their lives uh, or when uh in you know pakistan's president in in the 1980s the general zial haq when his plane exploded uh, i remember there was a uh, there was a what his copy of the quran was left untouched Okay everybody had died on the plane but the copy of the Quran uh, was found so all of the newspapers it was a huge story that you know this is a miracle you know everybody died on the plane but the Quran was preserved and i was thinking it was like this is ridiculous i mean the Quran you can get copies of the Quran at every store you know for very little money but what you know all those people who died that you know that's actually the worst part so you know allah's priorities seem to be really mixed up so this was a I I would kind of think of things like that often uh, and it was very confusing to me the way that people would process this other people would process it and I'd process it and for a while I thought I was wrong because you know they're all they're all adults they probably know what they're doing uh but it uh, you know when I became an adult myself I realized I was right and they were all wrong so Oh, hello. Are you there? Did I lose you? Yeah, hello. Yeah. <laughs> There was a glitch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I got dropped off. You understand like internet in the subcontinent sucks. And especially in India.
by some of the giants and yeah can they you hear me okay provide a very low bandwidth yeah i can hear you well. can okay. you hear me yes i can i can yeah yeah sure so explain about how you became a skeptic uh, i assume in the meantime when i was not here oh sorry and you cut out there so you explain how you become a so how you became a skeptic at what yeah. age you became started becoming skeptic so you explain that part so i assume yes. the audience uh, did understand that you have to like this probably uh, i can yeah, see I people so. waving and so you said mm-hmm. you were in pakistan for medical uh, mm-hmm. studies so right. how was the like, first question i would like with the family and friends had and what was their reaction like how did they take this part uh so you're saying uh, sorry you cut out there a little bit so you're, the family and friends sort of respond to me becoming a skeptic is that the question okay uh, yeah that's what my question okay so yeah i had uh my my family has all kinds of people so in the my extended family my parents were both university professors uh so they were you know even though they were religious they were sort of moderately religious so they'd go in and out of phases and they, they they never um they always encouraged us to ask questions i mean it wasn't i didn't have the kind of family where they i i thought that i would be disowned or i thought i'd be rejected um if i asked the questions if i told them what i thought so i was I, i was always very comfortable asking them these questions and they would argue with me uh they would sometimes they would get tense uh, they were also concerned about security issues i mean saudi arabia you know these things are very um they have legal consequences so uh they were concerned about some of those things but they never i never had a fear that i would lose my family because of it and i i realized later on um when i started uh, talking about this and and really meeting other people from the same background that i was in a privileged position probably in a minority position where i had parents who were generally comfortable with this kind of thing um most uh, parents uh, aren't so uh, especially in, in in south asia and i i've seen this actually with whether it's uh, you know with muslims i've seen it with hindus i've seen it with Christians, like just basically people who are super religious um they tend to take it really badly when their children don't uh, share the same um world viewpoint that they do and so uh, for for me um i i was fortunate in the sense that my uh, my parents were okay with it they did get annoyed uh but uh, later on they did start seeing uh, my side of things i also saw their side of things i understood at that point the difference between the but what and what I there's a central theme in my book there's a big difference between ideas and people so islam is a very different thing from muslims you know religion itself is a very different thing from religious people um so even though i had huge problems with religion and with islam i knew that my parents were good people we're all a lot more than just our beliefs so i think that that part of it Uh, later on sometimes is missing in the conversation people conflate they think okay if muslims believe in islam then they must all be terrible people and that's just not the case um there are many different kinds of muslims in the world and uh many of them my entire family my family's muslim my extended family's muslim you know i care for them deeply they care for me uh do we have disagreements but uh, i think that that was the biggest um experience for me i think it was very good for me to learn that you can disagree on ideas even with the people that you love the most but that doesn't the break the bond of the relationships and and you know that you have in life with, with human relationships in fact the reason that we oppose religion the reason we have problems with religion thing is because it drives people apart so um that that's not the goal the goal isn't to talk about this stuff and then alienate the people that you care about the goal is to um talk about ideas openly and still be able to maintain you know your relationships with your family and the people that you care about yeah wonderfully put so uh, i assume mm-hmm. you were lucky to have such parents yeah for sure 
Muslims do experience like this. They, in general, get sidelined by their parents, and some of them have very bad experiences. So, so family-wise, uh, probably they got annoyed annoyed by your questions, but they were somehow supportive mm-hmm. of you, and they generally accepted the idea. So, how That's was right. uh, life like? Yeah. So, did you discuss these things with general? Sorry, with general what? You got cut out? In college. Uh, oh, in public, uh, probably you might not have discussed these things in South, Saudi, but probably you might have talked about these things with your college fellows, your college yeah. classmates in Pakistan. I, um, there are times when I, uh, I, I, I did sort of get close, but the reaction wasn't good. So I, I kind of kept it to myself a lot. And the other thing is in college, I was trying to... Um, get back into it. I was trying to find a liberal form of the religion. I met a lot of very sort of liberal Muslims who uh, had, they said that they were called Quranists. So they just completely rejected the Hadith. Hadith is where all the really crazy stuff is. But the Quran, and they would take the the verses in the Quran, they'd interpret them very, very liberally. And and it was sometimes a little too liberal, um, where they would completely change the meaning of the verse. Um, So a lot of it was apologetics. And I did try my hand at that. And I, uh, you know, but ultimately it didn't, it didn't really work out. So in college, I was kind of going through this, um, this struggle of, can I reconcile these beliefs and these scriptures and these books with what to me, with what I see in the natural world, what there is evidence for, you know, what, what, uh, what the science says. Um, And I tried for several years, but it, it didn't work out. Uh, But I, no, I didn't, I didn't talk about it as openly in Pakistan at, at all. No, I only really started talking about it when I came here. And Pakistan said, like, these kinds of things, that they're very taboo. It's, it's very dangerous. I mean, we know of cases in Pakistan where people have been lynched to death. And uh, it was even worse before. And, you know, now, at least, it's normalized a little bit. But at that time, it was a, it was a pretty bad situation. Mm-hmm. So, like, there is a dilemma with people like us and you who are into kind of an activism against, you can say, mm-hmm. against the organized religion, sort of. So you talked about a point where you seem to have met people who are liberal Muslims, and they were Quranists, who used to take the most liberal possible uh, meaning of the Quran. So how do you, like, mm-hmm. how, how, how should we deal with such people? Like, even in India, we have people who say, oh, no, Hinduism is different. In- Yeah, I think so. I the, sorry, I, th- I think you got. Is. Yeah, go ahead. Huh. So, how do, how should we deal with such kind of uh, opinions? Like, because we when say we completely outrightly reject religion. So, right. so when there are people who come and claim uh, or like try to find science in religion or try to take the most liberal view out of it. In both the ways, you might have seen like there are people who take science out of religion, like from the scripture, they try to mm-hmm. prove like, see, our God knew what the scientists know. So yeah. in your... ...opinions and such people. Uh, so what do we do with, um, I guess, yeah, these are the apologists, the apologetics. Uh, what do we do? I, I think we just keep on speaking. I, In my experience, I found that Whenever I speak to the more fundamentalist people, they're more interested in having an, a conversation. Like the super religious, the bearded mullahs, are, you know, when they find out that uh, I'm an atheist, you know, they'll be like, "Okay, let's have a debate. Let's get on YouTube. Let's talk about this." And I've ended up actually forming, I would say, like some even a kind of quasi quasi friendships with them in a way. Um, but the the sort of the moderate, the wishy washy, apologetic type people are a lot more sensitive. Because they are, you know, they haven't really studied it. They're not really as immersed in it. Um, and for them, it's more a matter of identity. You know, it feels their identity, their security, they, uh, th- their identity is rooted in it. So when you criticize those ideas, they take it as a personal attack on their identity. You know, and they may not even be religious. You may have Muslims who have pepperoni who, or who, who drink uh, alcohol or, you know, who... Uh, you know, live with their girlfriends without marriage or whatever it is, you know, they, they commit the sins, the big sins in Islam, but they're very, very sensitive to any criticism about the religion because 
they take it as a as an attack of their identity and that's why that's what you get religion feeds into nationalism you're seeing that in india like with the hindutva thing a lot of it has become they've become like the jihadis of 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 india in a way that that the nationalism and the identity aspect has become so sort of inextricably bound with the ideology that they they have trouble separating it and that's a very dangerous thing when you take pride in an identity that you did not work to earn like race like nationality like the religion of your parents that you were born into then that causes wars that causes destruction that causes a lot of uh, issues that's a very dangerous thing if you take pride in an identity that you did work to earn you know like say your profession or if you're you're a parent or, or you know you have a, you're a musician or you have certain hobbies those kinds of things you take pride in that's actually enriching and that's something that's very constructive because you worked to earn it so that pride is actually deserved so there's a um that's i think the main issue with a lot of these uh, apologetic types and and i see that you know this you see i've i've spoken to a lot of uh, Muslims, I've spoken to a lot of Hindus, and you know, you, know, you guys probably know that you're ex-Hindu atheist for a reason. Um, and that you see, that's a common thread. And I always, I think, what I'd like going doing is going back to basics. Because some people will say, well, you know, Hinduism isn't isn't as bad as it's not as dangerous in Islam, which is true. Like the religion itself actually is not. It's not as dangerous as Islam. But there are there's a basic process by which you um, learn things and the, 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 you learn things by uh, you have a hypothesis you've got the scientific method right you have a hypothesis you look for evidence see if the evidence uh you know supports your hypothesis and then you know that's how you eventually decide what is true or not or what is more likely to be true uh, or not and that aspect is completely destroyed in every religion like if you look at the just the concept of faith what does faith mean I mean faith I don't have faith that this chair I'm sitting on exists. I know it exists. It's knowledge because I, I can see it. There's evidence. Faith by definition means to believe things without evidence, to actually just believe things with no evidence. You take that leap of faith that just, just believe it. This person's saying it. This book says it. Just believe it. You don't need any evidence for it. And that's a, that's a bizarre thing. That's basically like me telling you to believe rumors, like believe rumors so so ardently uh, that that you're willing to die for them these things that don't have so faith itself is a um is a very toxic toxic thing right faith like a religious faith um and there are negative things about you know like with 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 islam you know there's a lot of problems like the belief in the afterlife is a huge issue if you believe everybody's in a better place if you believe that everybody's going to die and death is not death but it's a continuation of life and life gets even better in the afterlife because you know you're in heaven forever then you're not going to value your life on earth you know martyrdom like sacrificing your life in the way of god is considered to be a virtue it's not a virtue it's a terrible thing to do but the reason it's a virtue is because people don't value life on earth in hinduism people say well you know hinduism the the concept of reincarnation is so beautiful the concept of reincarnation is actually it's a very scary thought because what that means you know with 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 karma is that if you are born into a lower caste then if you're born underprivileged then you somehow deserved it because what you did in your past life your actions in your past life caused you to be born here so wherever you are you're you're born in poor conditions we're not going to let you have the opportunities to rise up because you earned this, this is what you did you know um and and you deserved it and that's that's actually that's a terrible way you know to to deal with human beings so some of these really basic things like like faith like you know um this concept of reincarnation a lot of these things that we think are very beautiful are not they're they're extremely extremely toxic when you really look at them so i think those are the conversations with the apologetics I like to have just go back to basics and look at the really big things and don't get involved in the minutia of, you know, what does this verse say? What does this hadith say? You know, what does this translation, is this right translation? And like all of those things, just go back to the basics. Like, why do you believe what you believe? The like, number one reason people believe what they believe is because they were born into it. Right? And they were taught it when they were kids. They would never believe this stuff if they heard it when they were adults. Right. 
yeah wonderful report yeah so like we are coming to on the end as we took just 30 minutes from alibai so i'll ask mm-hmm. quick uh, two three questions so you uh, very nicely put how to deal with the apologetics so mm-hmm. can you like uh, very briefly tell any of your experience where an apologetic guy has put you in a soup no put me in a what put you in a soup or uh, give you a hard time like these apologetics were like really something which were hard to counter any such experience which you would I, like to share with us yeah that's a that's a good question i've never really had a hard time from uh, apolog- apologists or apologetics uh, when it comes to the actual content of what we're arguing um but they've if they they've given me a hard time sometimes it's by saying that I, i i don't like the tone in which you're saying this or what you're saying is offensive or what you're saying why would you want to hurt the sentiments of so many people like those are the kinds of uh, arguments that they they would put forth ultimately in the end that this is you know or or they'd say you know there's so much uh, anti muslim sentiment here you know why are you talking about this is so much anti you know whatever you know they feel like there's some groups that are victimized and you shouldn't be speaking about them and again i reemphasize that it's not the groups that i'm talking about i mean these people are the people in my family a lot of my friends it's the ideas that i'm talking about and when you ideas don't have rights they're not entitled to respect um human beings do have rights they're entitled to respect and there's a difference between the two of them if you when you challenge ideas throughout history whenever you've challenged ideas you move your society forward uh, whenever you when you, when you demonize people you rip societies apart so uh, history is always like any transformational change started as a blasphemy islam itself started as a blasphemy i mean the muhammad went against the religions of the of the quraysh what they believed you know he 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 was chased out of mecca with them when he came back he went to their their gods their idols and he took a stick and he destroyed them all um so now when people draw cartoons you know everybody freaks out but this is what he did he actually set the example uh, for last me and any sort of any social any cultural political revolution that you look at always started with a rebel uh who was an an outcast it's Susan B Anthony or Gandhi Martin Luther King or Muhammad Jesus all of these people be milk like they they all started out as rebels and then eventually uh, they became revolutionaries so uh you know very it's a very important thing and when people I'm having a conversation with some of these apologetics and they come back to me and they start talking about the tone in which I'm speaking or um the the effects of what I'm saying or that it's it's offensive I mean those are all deflections from uh it's an excuse not to talk about the the content of what I'm saying not to talk about the ideas they don't want to talk about the ideas they want to move the conversation from the ideas to the people so you have to reiterate over and over again that I'm not after the people I'm just talking about the ideas stick to it. So I've no I've I've never had a hard time having a debate because it's really easy. You know, it's very easy. One person saying that the virgin gave birth to this guy who then walked on water and then he uh, you know uh, turned water into wine and and then he you know died for 3 days then he came back, you know. So when they say that, it's <laughs> that's not a difficult argument to refute. You can immediately you know go after that or you know this man he flew up to heaven on a on a winged horse or this man had an elephant head and he's got many arms you know the, like these are it, these are just things that you can uh, refute very very easily uh so the the arguments never really the issue that's not where they get the hard time great i really like the point that you said ideas don't have rights people do have rights in india we tend to have like thread on this thin line where sometimes speaking against islam is uh, labeled as islamophobe so mm-hmm. because we have already have a problem of a you can say a organization which is openly against people rather than the idea but yeah. again when we say like so yeah we do tend to tread on the thin line so right no, no no this is actually this is a really really important point you brought up. oh 
yeah, sorry about the intro. You you were getting cut out, so that's why I started speaking. But that's it. No, that's you a, continue. Yeah, you continue. No, no, that that's an excellent point, Praneet. And this is why I, this is this is a this is a place where the the whole difference between ideas and people, you know, criticizing ideas versus demonizing people, comes into focus. Uh, because when you are yes, when you're in India, right, and you have this, uh, you know, you have all these issues going on, you know, with the uh, with the CAA and the NC, like those, you've got. Uh, a lot of anti-Muslim sentiment, a lot of anti, you know, the Muslims are minority there and they're, they're being, you know, cracked down on. And in the same way in Pakistan, the way they treat Hindus in Pakistan is horrendous. The way they treat, treat their Christian minorities in Pakistan is horrendous. So, you know, we we see it on either. It's a it's a minor, majority minority thing. And for me, it's about people. You should not treat people that way. It doesn't matter, you know, who they are, what they believe. This is not the way that you treat human beings. So, this is when we start conflating faith and ideas with human beings, that's what happens. You know, you start thinking of all of a whole group of people as the same and as a different tribe. And uh, you, you think that violence against them is, is justified. And this is something that, that all of us, that all, all of these people do, all of them do. Um, unless you have like secular countries and, you know, I'm, I have, a, I really have a hope, for, I have more hope for India than I do with Pakistan, but I think I'm, I'm concerned that India is also going down. The, like it's almost like the these Hindutva and Hindu nationalists are looking at Pakistan, saying, "Oh, like you know, this is yeah, we should do the same thing." It's like, why would you want to do the same thing? You know, you have a system. You're you have a history of secularism. You have a history of being the world's largest democracy. You have the history of pluralism, where you had all kinds of people of different faiths and different ethnicities. You know, living together peacefully. All of your, your biggest Bollywood actors, you know, come from Muslim backgrounds, and they're, they're not even religious. Like Amr Khan is not a religious. He says he's an atheist. Uh, you know, Shah Rukh Khan himself, you know, he has a he has a wife who's uh, I think Hindu, right? And he's not cha- raises children very religiously. Uh, you have your you know the head of your your nuclear program, right? And back in 1998, he was a Muslim guy. There, there are and and this was a tradition of India that was wonderful that you know people all live together, and that's just being. Uh, that's the character, as far as I'm concerned, of of what India is, and it's it's a it was a beautiful thing, and, and now it seems like there are people over there, um, you know, the, these Hindu nationalists who are hell bent on on tearing it apart, and it's unfortunate because we've seen that happen with Muslim fundamentalists. I've seen that happen in Pakistan. I've seen that happen in, in Saudi Arabia. Pakistan is a f- failed state. It's a collapsing. Um, rapidly, why? Because it's because of this. Is because of all this religious fervor. Uh, so, you know, I I, I really hope. Uh, yeah, you, know, you can you can only hope that things do get better and people do understand that uh, when we're talking about ideas, we should be able to talk about ideas without uh, without mistreating mistreating and and abusing people. Yeah, very nice point. So, thank you mm-hmm. for that. So, like, we are coming to the close. So, I would like to ask you a few small questions. Like, you talked about how to deal with the apologetics of organized religion. So, we have this organized religion which have a lot of myths in them, which are easily debunkable. But then Mm -hmm. there are some apologetics who claim like they don't believe in any religion, but... Yeah, I'm sorry, you got cut out again. you said, there's some apologetics who claim they don't believe in a religion, but yeah, but they believe like there is some super power, there is some uh, superior power, uh, a godlike, but they don't uh, give it a shape or form. There is some power which controls everything. Mm-hmm. You understand the point? Like yes, these do, are apologetics from yeah, they don't they don't have a baggage of being called a Hindu or a Muslim or something. But they mm-hmm. say we believe in that power. Like we don't pray, we don't do anything, but we, we, we but we believe like there is some power which is uh, like controlling everything. Mm-hmm. So have, did you have any experience of meeting such kind of uh, yeah, yeah. apologetics? Um, I, I do, and I, I actually do. I, I like that, and I respect their point of view. Like, I may not always agree with it. Like, if they believe that there is a higher power that's telling us what to do, that cares about what we eat and everything, then those things I, I don't believe in. But 
uh, the sort of non-religious people who say that there must be, there's probably something out there. I respect that because I think that uh, it's not defined. So, you know, you have pantheists, you've got deists who don't believe that whatever's, that who believe that there may be a God, but he has, he's not really interfering in uh, the human affairs or he doesn't care about human affairs. So I, uh, I, I do respect that, that, that makes a more rational sense. I think that, you know, obviously, I mean, the universe is full of mysteries, a lot of amazing things. And there's time dilation, there's a, there's a big bang theory, the idea that, you know, time and matter started with the big bang, the idea of the space time fabric, you know, general relativity, quantum, physics. there's so many amazing things, evolution that have happened, um, that sometimes you wonder, is there a pattern? Sometimes you get into the mood, like there's got to be something. And then when you do, um, you know, you think, well, maybe it is, maybe the laws of the universe itself, or maybe the universe itself is a sort of a, a conscious or sentient being. Maybe and those are ideas that even though I think that there are flaws in them, and but they're certainly um, ideas that you can legitimately have a conversation about. Right, you could legitimately talk about those things. So I, I don't have, I don't really have any problems with uh, those, uh, those kinds of apologetics. The, the only time I have a problem is if they, uh, if if they start believing in things without uh, the evidence. Like for example, if they're astrologers, you know, because you know, there's this is the planets are in this position. That's why I believe. I mean, there's no. Then, then I would say, okay, well, what's the evidence? That then, if they believe in it so strongly, it's like a religion. Then, then that that becomes an issue. But overall, if there is a question of this, maybe this is possible. What if this? What if that? I, I'm quite comfortable uh, with people like that. In fact, I'd like to see more people um, th that way. Oh, sorry, Praneet. I think I lost you again. Oh. <laughs> You've sent Hello, me a can you hear me private now? chat. I really have. Yes. I really have a bad internet. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, the internet got it's sucking right now. So, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, thank you, Ali. Yeah, uh, it was wonderful talking to you. It was wonderful having you in our stream, and we'll have you again, and we'll talk on these things even in in much deeper parlance mm -hmm. in the coming sessions. Uh, so. Yeah. I would like to give you the mic uh, the, to conclude uh, and what your thoughts on our channel and what do you think about like how the society should be like in brief uh, so that we can end. It was wonderful having you. Uh, I don't know how much time my internet will support, but uh, yeah, the mic is yours. Uh, sorry, this time my mic got unplugged. So can you hear me okay? You know, yeah, lot of Yeah, yes. I think, uh, you know what we talked about. I think it's it's uh, good. I, I um, I, 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 all I'm going to say is like anytime you hear something, you know, question everything. Uh, there is a, uh, it's it's a good it's a good thing to question things. It's a good thing to look for evidence for things. It's it's a, it's not good to you know believe things just outright without evidence always be conscious of your own biases all everybody has their biases you know i have my biases too uh but you know don't uh, there's nothing in the world that's sacred there's nothing that's sacred except for you know just just the idea that the many things that are uh, unknown human beings the relationships with each other you know the way that every the dignity of human beings is that something that's sacred uh, but aside from that, ideas, there's no idea that's sacred enough not to be scrutinized, not to be challenged, not to be questioned. So, um, you know, that's that's really all I would say. And thank you for having me on. I really appreciate this, Praneet. Yeah. 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 Yes. And keep and doing the work that you're you, doing. Ali, for coming. And it was, yes, yes, it was wonderful having you. Thank you. Thank you for your appreciation. And we'd like to have you again. And we'll talk. In detail about your channel, which has a very interesting name, Secular Jihadist. I really like that name. And yeah, we'll secular discuss jihadist. how how to progress in our yeah, in how to progress in our jihad <laughs> of our secular <laughs> jihad. So it was wonderful yeah. having you. It would, and yeah, yeah we would love to have you Thank on you, too really. because I think we have had uh, many. Uh, you know, there's a I'd like what I like about you guys is that you're consistent. I mean, you're not. Uh, you, you you are consistent across everything. You're not like Hindu apologists either. A lot of times I meet atheists from India who tend to be um, sort of 
very they defend many myths yeah. and then they go against other ones and there's a an inconsistency there so uh it's a very hard thing to do it's a very hard thing to be consistent to break away yeah. from the way that you're raised so i really really appreciate that and lots of respect for you guys, to you guys for that thank you yeah